Today we're going to look at a really nice integral from a pretty classic integral book called Inside Interesting Integrals, and this is called Dini's Integral. So it's the integral from 0 to pi of the natural log of 1 minus 2 alpha cosine x plus alpha squared dx. Okay, so to get this started, I'm going to consider alpha as a variable, and then that means that the output of this integral will depend on alpha. And so I'll call that a new function called i of alpha, i for integral kind of obviously. And then furthermore, perhaps we need to say what values of alpha can take. And well, we're only going to depend or we're only going to consider a certain range of values of alpha, and that is alpha is either between 0 and 1, not including 1, or between 1 and infinity. And you'll see why we cannot have it depend or why we cannot have it equal 1 uh, via our calculation. Okay, so to get started, let's notice that, well, we let alpha be a variable, and that really motivates us to use Feynman's favorite trick, or really the internet's favorite trick of differentiation under the integral sign. So let's do that. So we'll take the partial of i with respect to alpha. And so that's going to give us the integral from 0 to pi. And then, of course, the derivative of the natural log will just send its argument downstairs. So that's going to be 1 minus 2 alpha cosine x plus alpha squared. And then, of course, by the chain rule, we need the derivative of that argument in the numerator. So that's going to be minus 2 cosine x plus 2 times alpha. Okay. So now what we'd really like to do is maybe perhaps get an alpha squared upstairs so that we can simplify this a little bit. So we'll do that by multiplying by alpha over alpha. So I'll take one of the alphas and put them in the denominator outside, and I'll take the other alpha and I'll multiply it through. So that'll be minus 2 alpha cosine x plus... Well, that's going to be 2 alpha squared, but I'm going to take that 2 alpha squared and write it as alpha squared plus alpha squared. And then, of course, my denominator is not changing. I have minus or 1 minus 2 alpha cosine x plus alpha squared. And now, well, you can maybe get a glimpse of what we're going to do next. Notice we've got a minus 2 alpha cosine x here and here. That is in the numerator as well as the denominator. We also have an alpha squared in the numerator and the denominator. But now what I'd like to do is build up the numerator so that we can split it into two pieces. One that's equal to the denominator and then, well, the leftover bit. So I'm going to do that by adding a 1 right here. But if I add a 1 right there, that means that I also have to subtract a 1. So I'll subtract a 1 right there. Okay, nice. And then, well, let's observe that this stuff that I have in the pink parentheses is exactly what I have in the denominator. So since it's exactly what I have in the denominator, when I split this into two pieces, well, I'll just get the number 1. Okay, so let's write that out. I have 1 over alpha and then our integral from 0 to pi of 1 plus, or I'm actually going to write this as 1 minus 1 minus alpha squared over, well, that denominator that I've had the whole time. Okay, so that's where I am at the moment. So now what I'll do from here is I'll integrate out this constant 1. So let's see, that's going to give me, well, I've still got this 1 over alpha, and then I'm going to have a pi here, and then I'll have minus, well, this integral that I've got. So let's see, minus the integral from 0 to pi, then I've got my denominator, 1 minus 2 alpha cosine x plus alpha squared. My numerator is unchanged. Okay, so that's where we are at the moment.
And now maybe as a final step on this board, let's look at the integral that we have left over and observe that it's really a rational function involving, well, sines and cosines. There are no sines there, but there is a cosine. And there's a classic trick called Weierstrass substitution, or maybe the half angle tangent substitution, which allows for a great deal of simplification here. So what we'll do is we'll set t equal to the tangent of x over 2. And now solving for x, we'll see that x is 2 times the arctangent of t, which tells us that dx is equal to 2 over t squared plus 1 dt. And then playing some tricks with some trigonometric identities, you can find the values of sine and cosine in terms of t. And what we'll get here is cosine of x is in fact equal to 1 minus t squared over 1 plus t squared. Okay, so let's put that all together. So I'm going to have a pi over alpha minus, um, let's see, minus 1 minus alpha squared over alpha. And then I've got my integral from 0 to pi of... Well, let's see, I'll have a 1 over 1 minus 2 alpha times 1 minus t squared over 1 plus t squared, and then plus alpha squared, and then my dx component. Well, let's see that that is 2 over t squared plus 1 dt. Okay, so we're running out of room here, so let's bring this object to the top and then we'll keep going. Okay, so this is where we ended up on the last board. And one thing that we didn't do on the very last step is change the bounds of integration. So let's do that real quick. So we had our lower bound as x equals zero, but t and x are related by t equals tangent of x over two. So that means t will be tangent of zero, but tangent of zero is simply zero. So that means this lower bound does not change. Okay, well, that's nice. And then what about that upper bound? Well, x is equal to pi, but what's the tangent of pi over 2? Well, let's observe that really this is x is approaching pi from below, given that we're integrating from 0 to pi. And if you let the argument of tangent approach pi over 2 from below, the output approaches positive infinity. So that's going to change this upper bound to infinity. Okay, so now we've got all of that sorted out. And now what we're gonna do from here is take this t squared and multiply it through. And well, let's see where that leaves us. I'm gonna bring down quite a bit of stuff. I've got my pi over alpha, and then minus two over alpha times one minus alpha squared, my integral from zero to infinity. And then let's see. I'll just put this dt in the numerator, and then I'll have an alpha squared plus one times a t squared plus one. Maybe we're gonna write it like that. And then we're gonna have a minus two times alpha times one minus t squared. Okay, great. And now perhaps what we'll do is take that denominator and collect the t squared terms as well as the constant terms. Okay, so let's look at my t squared term. I have an alpha squared plus one here, and I have a minus two alpha there. So I'm gonna write this as alpha squared plus, or sorry, minus two alpha plus one times t squared. Oh, but actually that's gonna be a plus two alpha because I've got two minus signs. And then what about my constant term? Well, now I'm gonna have an alpha squared minus a two alpha plus one, because in that case, I don't pick up a minus sign. But that actually factors kind of nicely. Notice that this is alpha plus one quantity squared times t squared. And then this one is alpha uh, minus one quantity squared. But in fact, instead of writing that as alpha minus one, I'm gonna write that as one minus alpha. It actually doesn't matter here because the whole thing is squared.
And then next up, what I'll do is factor this alpha plus one squared out of the denominator. So let's see what that'll leave us with. We'll have a pi over alpha here minus two over alpha, one minus alpha squared. And like I said, we're factoring this alpha plus one quantity squared out of the denominator. So that means I'm gonna have an alpha plus one squared right there. And then I'll have this integral from zero up to infinity. And then I'll have a dt over, now this is gonna be one minus alpha over one plus alpha all squared plus t squared. Okay, good. Then can we do a bit of simplification right here? Well, in fact, I think we can. Notice that this first term is one minus alpha times one plus alpha, and the second term is one plus alpha times one plus alpha. But then we get some simplification there. These one plus alpha terms cancel, and we're left with one minus alpha over one plus alpha. Okay. So in the end, I'm gonna have a pi over alpha and then minus two over alpha times one minus alpha over one plus alpha. And then, well, the remaining bit of this integral, which in fact, this integrand has a well-known antiderivative. And that antiderivative is something like this. We get the reciprocal of this squared term. So one plus alpha over one minus alpha. And then we'll have the arctan of, well, it's going to be, in fact, the reciprocal of this squared term times t. So 1 plus alpha over 1 minus alpha times t. And then, of course, we need to evaluate that as t ranges between 0 and infinity. But the eagle-eyed among you probably noticed that this term in the front cancels this term in the front. And we just have this nice evaluation to sort out. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, so here's our current position. And now you, will, you can see why we cannot have alpha equal to 1, because we've got this 1 minus alpha in the denominator. But you might say, well, I also have an alpha in the denominator, so alpha should not allow it to be equal to 0. But let's go over here and notice that if alpha was equal to 0, this whole integrand would collapse to the natural log of 1, which would give us just the integral of zero, which would be zero. So in fact, if alpha is equal to zero, well, our value is zero, but we'll see that that'll match up with the case when alpha is between zero and one, not including zero, so that'll be taken care of. Okay, so anyway, now let's observe that this bit right here, this evaluation bit, actually takes on values depending on where alpha is. So, well, it's gonna go like the following. So if alpha is bigger than one, then let's see what's happening. Well, if alpha is bigger than one, then as t goes to infinity, the argument is going to minus infinity. But if the argument of the inverse tangent is going to minus infinity, then the output is going to minus pi over two. Okay, but now if alpha is less than one, I guess I should say between zero and one, then the argument of the inverse tangent is going to infinity as t goes to infinity, which means the limit is pi over two. Okay, so that motivates us to build this into two cases. So perhaps for our first case, we'll take the case when alpha is between 0 and 1. But now let's observe if alpha is between 0 and 1, then what we get right here is cancellation. We'll have pi over alpha minus 2 over alpha times pi over 2, but everything cancels there. And we get the partial of i with respect to alpha is equal to 0, which means that our i of alpha is equal to a constant. But what constant is it equal to? Well, it's gonna be equal to the constant evaluated at zero, which is zero by our previous discussion. Okay, so there we have it. In one of our cases, we get that this integral is always equal to zero. So that means we should probably move on to the second case.
So that second case is, of course, if alpha is on the interval from 1 to infinity. But in that case, instead of everything canceling, we get everything kind of doubling up, if you will. In other words, we'll have the partial of i with respect to alpha is equal to, let's see, it's going to be pi over alpha, and then it'll be plus pi over alpha. So I believe that's going to be 2 pi over alpha. But of course, that doesn't really give us the value of i. That tells us that i is equal to 2 pi times the natural log of alpha plus a constant, which I'll just notate by those two question marks. We just have to figure out that constant. But there's this really nice trick that'll take us to the end here. And let's observe that if alpha is between 1 and, and infinity, 1 over alpha is between 0 and 1. I think that's pretty clear. But then we set up this nice equation. We have 0 is equal to i of 1 over alpha, which, well, you can calculate, and maybe I'll leave this as a little bit of a homework exercise, that this is in fact equal to i of alpha minus 2 times the integral from 0 to pi of the natural log of alpha dx. Oh, but this bit right here is simply what we had before. This is 2 pi times the natural log of alpha. So we have i of alpha minus 2 pi times the natural log of alpha is equal to 0. We set up this nice equation. But that, in fact, means that this question mark is simply equal to 0. So well, we can get rid of it, and we have our final answer in this other case as well. And that's a good place to stop.